Um, okay, welcome here this morning and, and thank you for your presentation. I suppose this committee is around the implementation of the UNCRPD, which very much endorses nothing about us without us. Mm -hmm. And so alarm bells ring when you have autistic people and organisations representing autistic people being so opposed to ABS, our ABA and, and PDS. And I presume that's not based on a whim. So why are they supposed to post and are opposed? I mean, I have to be guided by autistic people and what they say. But um, I think you have indicated that the, the practice can be harmful, has been in the, in the past, it has changed, it needs to be changed further, and it needs to be a human rights-based approach. So, um, but is the lack of regulation not the key here? And it needs to be regulated to ensure that it's not harmful, and I think there needs to be very, very strong engagement with autistic people and their representative organisations, because I certainly will be guided by them, as I will be by all disabled people, because I think they know best what is right and should have choice in the matter, um, and that's what's very important. Um, I suppose also the bigger um, issue as well is that psychologists are not regulated in this country. So, I mean, until I think there is regulation of both psychologists and then uh, as a, a further step um, behaviour analysis, we're going to have issues with people who are not properly trained and who are going to do more harm than good. Um, so I, I think that's that's the bottom line. Um, there, you know, the, and then the issue of restraint is a huge issue as well. We know it's been used in schools. It's physical. It's it's. Uh, through the use of drugs, and it's still being used. I know it's still being used, particularly through the use of drugs in many, many uh, institutions, um, and is where behaviour is being controlled by just basically drugging someone so that they're they're not aware of what's going on around them, and that's totally, totally wrong. So uh, I suppose that's my concern. I think when I will, the autistic community have to be convinced. Uh, if this if, if this is right and and it needs to be regulated, I think they're the main two points I want to make. Um, I'm, I'm so glad. I'm personally I'm autistic myself, mm -hmm. so when I hear somebody say I want to listen to autistic voices and autistic people and the disabled community. I think that's key, and as a society, we've really struggled with that. I grew up in the 90s where it just my rights were not enshrined in law. Um, so I had to muddle through a system that just really didn't protect me at the time. And uh, for myself now as a behaviour analyst and as an autistic behaviour analyst, it's really important to me and to uh, my fellow people here um, that the human rights of autistic people and anybody that we work with um, are completely enshrined in the practice that we do. And yes, sometimes it can feel very awkward to hear those uh, attacks towards applied behaviour analysis, but as we've said, those are justified. We're not going to sit here and say, oh no, nothing wrong has ever happened in the science. It has. And it's very important that we acknowledge that, uh, because if we keep pretending these things didn't happen, then we will continue to make the same mistakes. That what he, that's what human beings will do. So what we're really proposing here is um, a coalition, almost, uh, between a neurodivergent autistic community and behaviour analysts. Uh, behaviour analysts don't want to do anything to the autistic community. We want to work with the autistic community to help them to gain access access, as we said, to the environments that they want to engage in, um, the skills-based learning that they want. That's part of what we're suggesting Irish behaviour analysis can do because we have that opportunity. We've uh, distanced ourselves vocally <laughs> from uh, ABA International, which a lot of the autistic community have come out against, for example, the Judge Rottenberg Centre, etc. And we are making it very, very clear through many policies, through a very recent um, uh, conference that we had based in Athlone. It was the Division of Behaviour Analysis where the entire theme was around neuro uh, affirmative care. Um, the majority of symposiums and uh, keynotes were actually given by autistic practitioners. So we're seeing a shift. It's not going to happen straight away, but we are proposing that regulations are going to be a key part of doing that in line with hearing voices from the autistic community. Also being autistic, I have a lot to say in it because we exist in, I think Brian Middleton, quite a, a well-known autistic PCBA in our field. He calls it Middle Earth. 
because you, you live between the two communities. Um, but there is still kind of among some practitioners um, a lack of understanding of why behaviour analysis is not viewed in a positive light. Um, and they can be practitioners who see nothing wrong with expecting a child to be sitting perfectly still with their hands on the table and staring at you in order to listen. But there is an even bigger percentage of our field who understand that, like what I'm doing now, <laughs> fidgeting and twisting and not looking directly at the person I'm talking to, but they understand that this is an autistic or neurodivergent way of taking in information and processing information. So practices like, um, was it quiet hands? Is that what it is? Practices like quiet hands, look at me, you know, feet flat on the ground, that we also force on neurotypical kids, which is, is totally in opposition to what we all know about child development. Um, but like, the majority of us know that those practices, like, forcing this is not only unethical, but really unnecessary, because there is a greater understanding of how, I'm gonna stick to autism, because it's, it's what I know, <laughs> but like, th there's a greater understanding as to how the autistic brain operates, and how we process information, um, and I, th I think, like, I, I very rarely come across other practitioners who still insist on you know the eye contact or the still hands thing, or like complying with an instruction simply because you gave the instruction? Um, it's, it's totally it's like it's totally unnecessary. Like if I want to assess how a child you know understands prepositions, I'm not going to sit them at a table and do discrete trial teaching, which I think is heavily criticised and rightly so because it's boring. Um, but I'm not going to sit there across the table and expect this like three-year-old to, you know, point to the picture of a box under a table. I'm going to get down with my Playmobil house that I, I bought specifically because I love Playmobil and could never have it as a kid. Um, but I will sit down with them, with our little people, and I will assess that skill through play. But if they decide that they're done with the Playmobil house, I'm not focused on, no, well, I've, I've said that we have to do our prepositions with this. But, like, they want to go and choose something else. We're going to get a train. The train can go under the tunnel. Like, it's, it's, not, it's not a teaching strategy. It's a philosophy, and it can be applied in everything. Um, and that's, that is what we're, we want. We want to have regulations and an ethics code that our register of certificates have to adhere to so that we know everyone is practicing this way. And if a parent sees something that they don't like, they can report them, we can report the practitioner to us if they're not adhering to a code of ethics that says, you know, you have to practice in a way that respects this autistic person's human rights and their values. You know, you can't practice, we're gonna take it away. Like, you know, you're gonna, the teaching council, I'm, I'm a Montessori teacher. Um, my undergrad is in Montessori and I, I taught in, in special ed through Montessori for a very long time. But, you know, we have the teaching council and if you have an issue with a teacher, it's regulated, you can, you know, you go through your steps, your principal, your board of management, the teaching council, and that is what we want. Like, we don't continue to allow that teacher to practice unethically because we've got a code that teachers have to stick to. And, as behaviour analysts, that's what you want. We want a code where someone can say, I am not happy with how this person did this. Did they adhere to the code of ethics? If they didn't, they can't practice anymore. That's, yeah. Um, so just on, on the point that you made about uh, having to listen to people, you know, we completely agree with you. It's so important. Um, we, ISBA set up their Experts by Experience panel. So we want to hear the voices of 
all individuals and what their needs and what their wants are. And, you know, we have listened very carefully to the concerns that have been raised by the autistic community, as I'm sure you have as well. Um, but we have also listened to the individuals who have, ha who have very positive experiences with behaviour analysis and with those behavioural supports. So I think it's very important to get a, a, a well-rounded view and maybe listen to the opinions and the experiences of everyone. Um, and we're hoping that that's what the Experts by Experience panel will be able to bring, that we'll be able to listen to the voices of all of those individuals. For some individuals who maybe require behaviour supports more, it's more difficult for them to be able to communicate their desires and their values and their wishes. So as behaviour analysts, that's what we work to do. We work to try to figure out how to... Um, encourage or promote the environment to be able to support that individual to be able to communicate. For example, if somebody chooses not to use vocal speech, that they can use an alternative method of communication. Um, so I think, yeah, in general, I mean, we don't want to get into a this versus this or he said, she said. We want to make sure that we have everybody's voices, but also we need to focus on what the key point here is, and that's how do we ensure that any kind of behavioural support provision is provided within a human rights framework. The necessity for behavioural supports is not going to go anywhere. You know, there are always going to be individuals who require behavioural supports. And I also completely agree with you that psychologists are not regulated yet. So I'm, you know, I'm a member, member of the Psychological Society of Ireland. We both have our psychology undergraduates. We're working with and we're supporting the Psychological Society of Ireland in terms of submissions to KORU, because KORU are, are going to hopefully regulate psychology in Ireland. And then the Division of Behaviour Analysis and the Irish Society for Behaviour Analysis, we're already working hard to try to ensure that KORU can also regulate behaviour analysts. So far, what the Division of Behaviour Analysis, we have the Psychological Society of Ireland have accredited to master's behaviour analysis courses and what that means is individuals who have an undergraduate degree in psychology and who go on to do those masters and accrue appropriate experience, they can become chartered psychologists. At the moment in Ireland that's sort of the only kind of, it's not proper regulation but it's the only sort of regulation that we have in terms of the recognition of the title of psychologist. Um, and then, aside from that, then, we have a number of people who um, um, have experience in behaviour analysis or have done those masters who don't have the undergraduate degree in psychology. So those individuals can't progress towards chartership with the Psychological Society, but that's where the Irish Society for Behaviour Analysis comes in, and we're working really hard to try to set up those structures to ensure that we can then knock on Koru's door and say, <clears throat> here's what we have, regulate our profession. I don't know if you want to add anything yeah, on that. That's, that's exactly right. So that's the reason why you have two organisations here, which are the Irish Society of Behaviour Analysis and, and the Division of Behavior, the Psychological Society of Ireland's Division of Behaviour Analysis, essentially is that the way the field has grown is that um, people with different undergraduate degrees in nursing, social care, pharmacy, I've supervised a pharmacist in the past, have mm -hmm. gone on to study uh, behaviour analysis and without, without another organisation that would block their progression to professional practice and evidently we want the field to be broad uh, and inclusive and include uh, additional disciplines um, and that's why we have two organisations, one for those with an undergraduate degree in psychology and one for those who have undergraduate degrees in different disciplines. And that probably reflects what's happening, uh, what is likely to happen at a European level. We're looking in, uh, in Ireland in the sense that Aoife McTiernan, the University of Galway, is president of the European Association for Behaviour Analysis, and we have very close links with our European colleagues and our colleagues in the UK SBA. So together with those organisations, we're working on standards for training, supervised practice and experience, and ethical standards that can be met at a European UK level. Um, and then national regulation for the profession at, an, at a national level. Um, so that's where we hope that behaviour analysis will develop in the future. Okay.